gather again together this morning as the people of God, called and chosen according to the purpose and will of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We pray, Almighty God, you saved us not because of righteous things we have done, but because of your mercy. You saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom you poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, that we may be justified by his grace and become heirs of the hope of eternal life. Amen. Amen. We are reminded by the words of the Apostle John, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We confess our sins. God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Now let us humbly come before God in a time of silent confession. Together we pray, our loving God, have mercy on us, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out our transgressions, wash away all our iniquity, and cleanse us from our sins. For whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Beloved, the Lord God says, come now, let us settle the matter. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. For in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he has lavished on us. In him, through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Thanks be to God. The peace of the Lord be with you. Let's take a moment to greet one another with God's peace. Our first reading is from Deuteronomy, the fifth chapter, page 182 in the Pew Bible. The, her, the Lord heard when you spoke to me, and the Lord said to me, I have heard what this people said to you. Everything they said was good. Oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and to keep all my commands always, so that it might go well with them and their children forever. Go tell them to return to their tents but you stay here with me so that I may give you all the commands, decrees and laws that you are to teach them to follow in the land I am giving them to possess. So be careful to do what the Lord your God has commanded you. Do not, uh, not, do not turn aside to the right or to the left. Walk in obedience to all that the Lord God has commanded you so that you may live and prosper and prolong your days in the land that you will possess. Our second reading is from Romans, the sixth chapter, page 1131 in the Pew Bible. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that through... Though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I am using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves to, as slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing ever wickedness, 
So now offer yourself as slaves to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things that you are now ashamed of? So those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Our gospel today, well, begins in Matthew chapter 4, then into Matthew 5, then into Matthew 7. You can figure out those page numbers on your own. We begin with chapter 4, verse 23. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. See, now I've got to get over to chapter 7 too, so hold on just a sec, there we go. Chapter 7, begin with verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundations on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority, and not as their teachers of the law. This is the gospel of the Lord. Lord Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this day, this day to come to you, to offer our worship to you, to hear your word to us. And so, Jesus, may you be honored and glorified in all that we do and say here. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, friends, are you guys ready for the greatest sermon ever preached? Yeah, that's right. You've been waiting a long time, huh? You're going to get to hear it, too. And uh, I guarantee that they will be talking about this for years. Of course, They've been talking about it for almost 2,000 years because, of course, the greatest sermon ever preached is not a sermon that I will preach or that Steve will preach or that anyone would preach but Jesus himself. So today we are beginning an expository sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount, which is the greatest sermon ever preached. It's uh, recorded in Matthew chapter 5, verses 7. And I'll just tell you right now, friends, this is going to be a little different for us as a church, because as an expository sermon or series, we're going to be going through this sermon basically verse by verse. So we'll be, we'll be here for a while. So go ahead and put a big, strong bookmark right in that page in your Bible. Augustine called the Sermon on the Mount a perfect standard of the Christian life. And it very much is. But we can also approach the sermon wrongly. And what I mean by that is some look at the Sermon on the Mount as kind of the new law, okay, a new set of moralistic guidelines for becoming right with God. Now, of course, we know we are saved by grace through faith. It is not by our works, so that's not a good way to look at this. Others will say, well, it's like the law in that it's, it's basically a mirror that we read that shows us just how bad we really are and just how poorly we follow the example that Jesus gave to us. But if we look at this sermon in those ways, we miss the beauty and the power 
that is in this sermon. Because this sermon is all about how we live in the kingdom of God. It deals with not, not the need for a new law, but the need for a new life. Think of it kind of like an x-ray machine that uses Jesus' own words to kind of see if we are truly believers. And if we are, are we authentic? Are we living as kingdom people? Now, as you noticed in our reading, we have the beginning of the sermon and the end. And I know that breaks all sorts of literary rules. But you know, John in his gospel in chapter 2, okay, chapter 2, he says, and after Jesus rose from the dead, okay, now that's really spoiling the ending of the story. I'm not really spoiling any ending, I don't think. But I've included the ending because this is where Jesus instructs us, informs us on how we're supposed to receive this sermon, what we're supposed to do with it. And then I've also included the verses leading up to the sermon, which begins in chapter 5, because it gives us some important context. If you've been in any Bible study with me, you know context, context, context is so crucial. And so that's where we're going to begin. If you're following along on your blue sheet, it's point number one. We're going to start at the beginning, the context. Chapter 4, verse 23, truly sets the scene for what's going to happen throughout this whole, well, really throughout the whole Gospel of Matthew. Matthew writes, Jesus went through Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Matthew uses this little set of phrases a couple times through his Gospel, because what it does is it gives us this great snapshot of the mission of Jesus. His mission was to teach, proclaim the good news of the kingdom, and heal. Now, what's the good news of the kingdom? Well, the good news of the kingdom is that it was at hand. It was there. Now, if you're not real familiar with this kind of kingdom language that Jesus uses, it'd be real easy to look at this and just go, now, wait a minute. What kind of kingdom is he talking about here? Uh, there's no, like, castle or palace form. There's no army. There, there's no land. Well, Jesus says this because he himself is the king in that kingdom. And where he reigns, there the kingdom of God is already present. Or maybe another way to think of this is to belong to the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, the Gospels use those terms interchangeably, is to belong to the people among whom the reign of Christ has already begun. So we are right now in the kingdom of God. Now we also know that the kingdom will be fulfilled in a much greater way in the future. But we can't miss the fact that we, right here, right now, are living in the kingdom of God. So, as we begin this study on the Sermon on the Mount, you've got to understand that kingdom living isn't just a list of legalistic rules to follow. No, it's all about living in a way that can never be separated from a right relationship, not with the law, but with Jesus himself. Because Jesus didn't preach this sermon to shame us and to leave us feeling hopeless. No, instead he's giving us this beautiful vision of the life that God desires of us. And as Jesus has been teaching and proclaiming and healing, now we find out that large crowds are beginning to follow him. In chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, it says, Now when Jesus saw the crowds... He went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. Okay, so this may seem pretty straightforward to us, right? He went up on the mountainside, he sat down, and he taught. But to the Jewish mind and the Jewish audience that Matthew, who is Jewish, is writing to, there would have been a greater significance in what he just said. Because Matthew is going to make a connection between Jesus and an Old Testament person that we should know pretty well, because who else in Jewish history was known for frequently climbing up mountains? Oh, anybody? Moses, thank you, yeah, Moses. Moses would go up on the mountain, he would meet with God, he would come down and teach the Torah. Or as uh, I had a professor at school who used to call it the Torah, because that sounds more like Jewish and it's more fun to say that way. 
And so Matthew sees this connection with Jesus kind of being this new Moses up on the mountainside teaching people this new moral vision. And not just as the Torah or as law, but he's teaching him this vision that's Jesus himself. One of the themes that we're going to cover frequently throughout this sermon is the fact that Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law, and I came to fulfill it. I came to complete it. And so we're going to take a little bit more of a look at that. But so we have Jesus now taking the position of a rabbi or teacher, going up on the mountainside. He sits down to teach his disciples, and of course we know that it doesn't take long before the crowds start forming around him, because by the end of the sermon, the crowd is already there. Because they want to hear this new Moses teach as nobody ever had. So that's kind of our context. Now with that, now let's jump to the ending. Okay, so this is kind of a spoiler alert if you don't want to know how the sermon ends. Well, that's tough because you're going to hear how the sermon ends. Sorry about that. I'm not trying to ruin the ending, but this is where Jesus tells us what to do with what he just said. Chapter 7, verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. I'm not going to go for the whole thing there. We'll get that to that eventually when we get to that point in our uh, series. But you know, as I read this, I thought, you know, it's kind of the hope of every preacher that people would put into practice what they've just said. But this isn't like any sermon that any preacher has preached. This is God himself in the flesh delivering this sermon. And what does he tell us to do with his words? He says the same thing that the Apostle James has been telling us all summer. Put his words into practice. So friends, this is more than just hearing what's being taught and becoming familiar with it. It goes beyond even agreeing with everything that's being taught. Because we can all do that, and Jesus says, you can still be a fool. Obedience to his word is what makes a difference between the wise and the foolish. If we're truly taking what Jesus says to heart, not just being hearers of the word, but being doers of the word, Jesus says, you can withstand anything. Whatever storm and wind and waves this life throws at you, you'll be able to stand up strong because your foundation is built on solid rock. God, how foolish would we be to simply hear his words and then walk away? That is not kingdom living. How did the people receive this? They were amazed, especially by his authority. Now, I'm a a little embarrassed to admit this, but I watched the movie Titanic last week. Thank you for the one. I think that was Steve over there going, (laughs) chick flick. Not really. It's about a big ship going down. Anyways, I was watching this the other day, and there's this scene towards the beginning where there's this modern technician who is describing to Rose, who was a survivor of the Titanic disaster, who's 100 years old. He's describing to her exactly how the ship sank. You know, it hit along the iceberg, and then it tilted up, and then it snapped in half, and it went down. And as she listens to this, She says to him, thank you for that fine forensic analysis, Mr. Bodine. Of course, the experience of it was somewhat different. You know, I think all of us can tell the difference between someone who speaks out of a vast knowledge and experience versus someone who speaks out of simply what they've read or heard someone else say. It's the difference between the voice of authority and the voice of a parrot. Now, the people of this day were very familiar with parrot voices. The teachers of the law were great at telling them that this is what this rabbi believed, and this is what the Pharisees taught. But with Jesus, they recognized something different. Not only did this guy know what he taught, and it wasn't just stuff from books or traditions. He was a living example of what he taught. The teachers of the law spoke from authority. Jesus spoke with authority. This reflected him, and it was amazing. 
Which leads us to the question, then, what should we do? Okay? Now, we can look at this story and, and admire the people's response and go, hey, good for them. They were amazed. They should have been. That was Jesus, right? And yet, Matthew never says that they obeyed. There's almost something kind of uh, sadly inadequate about their reaction. Kind of like going, hey, great sermon, Rabbi. That was fantastic. Hey, where do you guys want to go get lunch today, huh? And Jesus isn't preaching this just to show what a homiletic genius he was. Sinclair Ferguson writes, he preached it so that the authority people recognized in his preaching might be realized in their lives. Okay, so then how do we prepare for this? We're in for a long series here, friends, and this is going to be fun. So how do we prepare? Well, I'll give you two ways, posture and obedience. Posture, I want to read to you an example out of Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. It says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. God, my kids write this? I hear that all the time. Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. What was Mary's posture? It was that of a student, of a learner, of a disciple. Paul describes the same act of sitting at the feet of Gamaliel, the great Jewish teacher, where he learned. You know, we have no problem keeping ourselves busy like Martha, right? But Jesus says, no, Mary is the one who got this right. This is a time to sit down and listen. So how do we do this? Well, we approach this sermon as students, as learners, as disciples, with a spirit of humility and an openness to whatever Jesus says to us. We commit ourselves for this season. Maybe you'll commit with me. This season, just to sit at the feet of Jesus. You know, maybe this means that you read the Sermon on the Mount each week, or maybe even every day. It's only Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And read it in a disciplined manner as that of a disciple. Because, friends, nothing compares to the hearing and reading of the words of Jesus. I came to know Christ not through the preaching of any preacher or an invitation given at a crusade. God uses those, I know that. I came to know Jesus by reading the Gospel of Matthew, by listening to the words of Jesus and observing how he lived and how he loved. Because you could read all the books ever written about him. You could listen to every sermon ever preached about him. You could sing every song ever sung about him. And nothing compares, though, to hearing his voice in his word. Because remember, it's only the fool who hears these words and then doesn't put them into practice. Which then leads us to the second part, obedience. Now, we're going to talk about what obedience looks like, what that means through the course of this series. But today, I just wanted us to get one focus clear, just one. We are called to do what Jesus teaches. That's what a disciple is. It's not, as Steve would say, it's not rocket surgery. It's simply you do what Jesus tells us to do. That is our focus. This kind of obedience leads to a whole new life. And I'm not even trying to exaggerate here, friends. You cannot, you will not be the same person if you take the words of this sermon to heart. And please, if you measure yourself by everybody else, that's easy. Because let's face it, we justify everything, right? If we will actually take the time to measure ourselves by his standards, if we appraise our morals and our ethics by his, if we receive his teaching in humility and prayer and discipline, we are building on a foundation of 
rock. And please hear me clearly. I'm not talking about behavior modification here. This is all heart issue stuff. This is what the Apostle Paul talked about in Romans 12 too when he says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In fact, let me tell you a little story. This is about a guy named Mickey Cohen. Some of you may have heard of him. He was a, a gangster, like in the traditional gangster sense, back in the 40s and 50s in Los Angeles. And he did some really, truly horrifying stuff as a gangster. But in 1957, Time Magazine wrote a little article about Mickey's meeting with the evangelist Billy Graham. And this is what Mickey said, and I'm quoting him. And I'm sorry, in my head I hear Joe Pesci saying this. It's just, I think it's the gangster thing. Huh? But he said, I am very high on the Christian way of life. Billy came up, and before we had food, he said, uh, what, what do you call it, that thing they say before food? Grace, yeah, grace. Then we talked a lot about Christianity and stuff. So at that time, according to all reports, Mickey Cohen had become a Christian. But Mickey's lifestyle never changed. There were no fruits of the Spirit. There's no evidence of this change. And he was confronted at one point by some of his Christian acquaintances. And his response was, Christian football players, Christian cowboys, Christian politicians, why not a Christian gangster? <sighs> oh, Mickey. As the Apostle James would say, faith without works is dead. And as believers, we're in a very privileged and kind of dangerous situation because as members of his church, we call him Lord, Lord. You know, we see the working of his Holy Spirit here. There's no doubt about it. But we need to make sure we really know him. It's easy to fool people. It's easy to fool friends. It's easy to fool pastors. It's even easy to fool yourself. We learn the vocabulary, we say the right words, maybe adapt some kind of cultural practices. But is that what Jesus wants? Jesus is building a kingdom of authentic believers, those who are being transformed into his likeness, and the Sermon on the Mount is going to give us this picture of what that looks like, and it's so different from the world, because Jesus is going to tell us new ways to deal with enemies and violence ways to handle money, how to pray, what to do with a corrupt society, relationships, what it means to be a person. All of it, this incredible picture of what it looks like to have kingdom character. So what does this mean to you personally? I'm going to close with a few tough questions. Do you know Christ? Or do you just know the right words? Is the fruit of the Spirit evident in your life? Do you display kingdom character? What is he calling you to do? Well, hear the voice of our Savior as he says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, my teachings upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen. Lord, we come.